Good morning, afternoon and night. Dear attendees, colleagues all over the world. My name is Tibor Jokeves from Budapest, Hungary. The following webinar is organized by World Endoscopy Organization, Standard of Practice and Publications Committee that I, that I have been chairing for four years. The task of this committee to spread, to spread the endoscopic knowledge throughout, throughout the world, even in poorer countries, by establishing uh, standards of the practice. The learning objective uh, today, uh, the topic really practical today, polyp removal techniques and tricks. The learning objective to characterize lesions, to select the appropriate methods and to perform them perfectly. We will have excellent lecturers from Asia, Europe and Australia as well. Before starting, I give the word to my good friend, a well-known expert in this field, to my co-moderator, Edward Despot from Royal Free Hospital, London, UK. Divad, would you be so kind to briefly introduce our speakers? Thank you so much, Tibor, and uh, thank you for this uh, kind invitation and honor and pleasure to be uh, organizing this uh, webinar with you. So uh, today we are uh, really lucky uh, to have some of the most well-recognized experts in the field. Um, uh, we are very, very lucky to have with us um, uh, Professor Yasushi Sano um, uh, from the Sano Hospital. Um, uh, Professor Sano needs no introduction, really. He is um, uh, uh, a very well-known expert, in, mainly in the field of optical characterization and lesion detection, but also uh, resection. He uh, has been the chief of the endoscopy department of the National Cancer Hospital East in Japan for 17 years before moving on to establish his Sano Hospital. He's also a professor at the Kansai University um, uh, and uh, in, in uh, Osaka. So uh, that is uh, uh, Professor Sano. Um, uh, we also are very lucky to have um, Dr. Razmiya Vlahu with us today. She is um, uh, an expert in her field in Greece. Um, uh, she has established the busiest uh, small bowel service in that region and uh, is also a co-organizer of the current um, uh, ESG days, which is due to happen next year. Uh, I also like to introduce my good friend uh, and colleague Alberto Moreno, who is um, uh, an advanced endoscopist and associate professor at Rural Free Unit for Endoscopy and UCL Institute for Liver and Digestive Health. Uh, he has published widely in the field um, uh, and his main areas of interest are uh, small bowel endoscopy and um, uh, endoscopic resection amongst many others. He has a passion and flair for education as well. I also would like uh, to introduce um, uh, Professor Nick uh, Burgess, who uh, has stepped in very kindly at the last minute um, uh, to cover uh, for uh, um, uh, Professor Michael Burke, who had the last minute commitment. Uh, Nick is uh, a very well-known expert in the field of endoscopic resection. He is the co-editor of uh, the Endoscopy Journal um, uh, and uh, in essence needs no introduction. We're very fortunate to have him with us too. And uh, last but not least, I would like to introduce uh, Professor uh, Yoshikazu Hayashi uh, from Jichi Medical University uh, in uh, Tochigi Prefecture, Japan. Yoshi uh, is also a very good friend, and uh, he is uh, the right-hand person for Professor Yamamoto, Jichi Medical University, um, uh, and they, together they co-develop the pocket creation method for endoscopic submucosal dissection. We will learn a lot of tips and tricks about this useful technique uh, and all its benefits. Yoshi is also extremely well published and a well recognized expert in this field. So uh, we are really, really fortunate. So before, uh, thank you so much guys for joining us. Um, so I'll, I'll just pass the baton on to uh, Professor Sano, uh, who will speak uh, to us about um, uh, lesion characterization uh, and selection of the appropriate technique. Uh, 
Thank you, um, uh, Yasushi. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, the world. Yeah, thank you for uh, giving uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, while uh, so COVID-19 is spreading in the world. So anyway, so I'd like to start my presentation. Um, and I'm focusing on the uh, so, uh, diagnosis. And my agenda is uh, when and how and a nice and genetic classification and critical usefulness of genetic classification. And I briefly explain the case learning. And as you know, the uh, wild colonoscopy, yeah, so two main role uh, wild colonoscopy. One is the, uh, this is a major role, uh, more than 95%. So, so quantitative diagnosis between neoplasia or non neoplasia I think this is uh, uh, very, uh, a little bit is easy uh, under the uh, so, uh, colonoscopy. But the other side is, uh, uh, I think maybe uh, more, more than uh, less than 5% uh, quantitative diagnosis estimation of depth of invasion. Uh, it means that so uh, mucosal invasion uh, cancer or some mucosal invasive cancer. This is slightly difficult. I explain you how to uh, assess the uh, some lesion uh, or characterize uh, such lesions. Most important is boil preparation, and the other is uh, uh, you have to uh, prepare uh, if you possible uh, scope with water jet function. Uh, it's uh, allow uh, much better to the uh, washing out the mucus on the surface, uh, removing the uh, mucus on the surface. And uh, I think uh, so the uh, strong water jet stepping uh, may cause uh, so unwanted uh, bleeding from the tumor so that you, you set the adequate setting uh, for the uh, water jet function. And the uh, attachment cap. Uh, is very, very important uh, to keep the appropriate distance from the parks. It's uh, uh, so very important to, 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 to take a good image. Yes. And uh, soft cap also in, uh, very important, provide breathing and black reduce the reflections. And standing, if you want to stand, if you want to assess the pit button or something, uh, you need a uh, so uh, standing solution such as uh, so angel coming die. We use a uh, one point zero point two percent angel coming die. So uh, while daily practice in Japan, and so this is a, a very famous uh, classification, gen nice classification. Uh, this is uh, so by uh, proposed in uh, two thousand eleven. And uh, international group, including uh, Professor Tanaka, Terry, and Loy, and uh, Professor uh, Sanders, and Douglas. Uh, and uh, so this is a very famous uh, so, uh, uh, classification. Uh, this is a taken memorial picture uh, in the Nice, uh, France. As you know, this classification is uh, divided into three types one, two, three. Uh, one created with a CSI. Lesion and a three are created with uh, invasive cancer, two created with autonoma. But uh, NICE 2 uh, contains several issues because uh, NICE is very simple classification. But the NICE uh, uh, classification type 2 uh, includes the, uh, so, uh, the rate of high confidence prediction is very low because type 2 include the various lesions, uh, uh, for example, the adenoma and the intramucous cancer and some cause are invasive cancer as well. So uh, the uh, Japanese uh, expert team classification, so-called genetic classification, uh, divided into four types. And uh, as you see, the uh, nice two divided into two type 2A and 2B. You know, uh, 2A, uh, so showing uh, the lesion, uh, showing uh, so bezel is regular and the surface of regular uh, tubra and the blanching pattern. But to be showing some irregular caliber and irregular distribution on the bezels and the surface also, also irregular or, or obscure pattern. I showed you some, and uh, this is uh, so I think uh, in the Western country, doctor cannot see the uh, genetic classification and the genet, uh, they, they don't like, uh, they don't like uh, so genetic classification because uh, so it needs a magnific magnifying endoscopy. But, Recently, uh, high resolution endoscopy. This is a video uh, using uh, so uh, recent uh, so 
uh, colonoscopy, so-called 1,500. This is uh, equipped with a high sensitivity CMOS immune sensor so that uh, uh, it is possible to obtain a 2A, 2B image uh, with uh, less noise, as you see. Uh, this is uh, uh, using an X1 system, uh, CF1500 dual focus function. You push a button, you can obtain the uh, high quality image, as you see. This is not zoom endoscopy. So you can available, you can, you can, you can diagnose the Janet classification very easily. Okay, so uh, this is a hyperplastic pipe. As you see here, uh, so uh, there is no capillary on the surface and the uh, structure uh, surface button is also the uh, uh, dot-like. And if you want to see the pit button, you spray the intercoming dye. And as you can see, the uh, this is a zoom scope, but as you can see the star-like uh, pit button on the surface. This is a typical hyperplastic part. And this is a uh, uh, Jenna 2B, uh, sorry, a uh, 2A, and uh, NBI with zoom. Uh, you can see the brownish bezel, regular brownish bezel on the surface and the tubular surface structure. So this is uh, classified as a Jenna 2A, or a nice 2. And this is an endocytoscopy, uh, standing at Mechelen Blue. Uh, you can see the uh, so, uh, cellular image, living cellular image in vivo. This is, a, uh, you can see the uh, pseudo stratification structure on the surface. So you can diagnose, so uh, this is the true rod normal in the vivo, real time. And I showed the, uh, this is an e-learning video. You can, ask, you can access this video, uh, Digestive Endoscopy Journal or YouTube. Please uh, search uh, Janet classification on YouTube. I show you the uh, part of this uh, uh, so e-learning video. The vessel feature of Janet type 2B is the irregularity, which means that the caliber of the vessels are variable and their distribution is not regular. In contrast to type 2A, the tubular structure on the surface becomes obscure or irregular. The most likely histology of these polyps is high-grade intramucosal neoplasia or shallow submucosal invasive cancer. JNET type 2B findings may be observable in deep submucosal invasive cancers. Additional magnifying chromoendoscopy is recommended to determine the appropriate treatment strategy of JNET type 2B lesions. Here we present a Cecil lesion 8 mm in diameter with a depressed area at the center. While elevated areas at the edge show regular vessel and surface patterns, the depressed area at the center has variable caliber, irregular distribution of vessels, and irregular surface structure, so this polyp is classified as JNET type 2B. By staining with crystal violet, type 5I pit patterns in the depressed area and type 3L pit patterns in the elevated area are observable. This sessile lesion was removed by EMR. The histopathological views show well differentiated adenocarcinoma without any submucosal invasion. So uh, you can assess uh, this video uh, on the so YouTube and uh, a total 10 minutes uh, in learning, but you can assess. And I, finally, I show the uh, Janet type three or nice three uh, lesions. Uh, this is a uh, uh, 2C2A type lesion. As you see the, uh, so with zoom, uh, the surface is uh, so amorphous. But the upper side, left upper side is showing some irregular weathers. So this is a Jenna 2B uh, plus Jenna uh, 3, you know. So uh, I recommend uh, so, uh, so additional chroma endoscopy. And uh, uh, usually we Japanese uh, so uh, observe the pit button. As you see, the, uh, this uh, pit button showing irregular pit button. Uh, kudos type 5i. So uh, in this findings, uh, we diagnosed as a deep invasive cancer uh, of this region. How to diagnose that so deep invasion? So this is uh, so our topics. Uh, so 
uh, so index for the uh, SM1000 invasion. Maximum diameter, maximum diameter of the irregular and the destroyed pits. It's very important. It's correlated with the depth of invasion. You know, the uh, so diameter is uh, more than six million, uh, more than three million size in flat and depressed type. It means a 2C or 2A or LST energy. So more than 3 million signs correlated with a 1,000 micro invasion. In contrast, proto-living region. Uh, so more than 6 million signs could those type 5I pits or could those type 5 pits uh, is correlated with 1,000 micro. So it's very easy to diagnose uh, uh, so your, so, uh, and ask the treatment uh, strategy indication. You know, please three me and six me is very important key to EMR or surgical treatment. So uh, this is uh, uh, invasive cancer. Uh, this is a pathological finding uh, in bed to some cause deeply. And uh, this is a lymph node metastasis positive. So anyway, uh, so this is my final slides. Uh, so, if the uh, region, uh, so showing the genotype one, uh, less than five million cells live inside you. Uh, but uh, so low confidence uh, or suspect uh, sessile cell region, you uh, remove and send it to pathology. 2A, of course, uh, you removed all. And genet 2B, uh, showing genet 2B, you, 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 I recommend the chromandoscopy or more detailed observation. And uh, so you precisely diagnose and, and select your, your treatment. And the Janet 3, if you have uh, with a high confidence, you send to uh, surgery. And if you, you have a so low confidence, you uh, assess uh, uh, additional. Uh, so uh, for example, EUS or, or some another uh, examination is required. So uh, this is uh, so uh, our product, uh, the poster, uh, so including a Janet and the treatment strategy. You can assess, uh, you can free run, download, please, uh, so AMBIC website. Uh, AMBIC means Asian Nobel Bioimaging uh, so website. Please uh, so assess this, uh, access this uh, so site. You can download this poster uh, and uh, please put on your uh, unit wall uh, this poster. So anyway, do your best colonoscopy. I think a practice makes perfect. Thank you very much for your kindness attention. Thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Sano. That was an incredible uh, tour de force. I, I'm uh, really, really grateful that you managed to give us so much information, uh, so much useful information in the course of 12 minutes. Thank you, really. Um, uh, so we'll move to the next uh, speaker and um, now we're going to start resecting and uh, we'll start with uh, cold resection. So uh, I introduce uh, Dr. Razmia Vlahu um, uh, and welcome her to share her slides. If you could stop sharing, um, uh, Yasushi, so that uh, Ersi can uh, share. And if you could uh, kindly start your presentation, uh, Ersi, it would be great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Despot, for the kind introduction and for the invitation and involving me in this webinar among all these highly esteemed colleagues. Uh, with no further ado, I will proceed with a presentation which is about cold snaring, a technique that, uh, since it was introduced in the, in the 90s, has been widely adopted in every endoscopy unit in what has been called uh, the cold revolution. And this not without reason, since uh, cold snare polypectomy has proved to be not only a safe, but also an efficacious and a precise resection technique. So uh, the rationale behind cold resection methods is that they induce less injury to the submucosa and especially the submucosal vessels compared to traditional polypectomy with uh, the use of electric artery. Therefore, they are related with less, less risk for delayed complications, including post polypectomy bleeding and perforation. Uh, so regarding the safety profile, uh, in a recent review published um, in Digestive Endoscopy and comparing uh, cold snare and hot snare polypectomy, delayed bleeding was observed a lot more frequently in the hot snare group whereas uh, intraprocedural bleeding was more prominently observed in the cold snare group. 
So now we know that this is universally observed. Uh, it occurs, it manifests mainly as um, uh, minimal oozing and is invariably clinically insignificant and self-limited and therefore does not uh, warranty any further endoscopic therapy. And apart from this uh, more favorable safety profile, there is also literature on the efficacy of cold snaring. Uh, so now we know that uh, it exhibits uh, higher complete resection rates compared to cold forceps polypectomy to hot forceps biopsy. And in this case, with minimal tissue injury, which allows for a better evaluation of the uh, retrieved specimen. There are also randomized controlled trials comparing hot and cold snare polypectomy that also reveal that these two techniques have uh, similar complete resection rates. Therefore, according to all the evidence, um, cold snare polypectomy has been integrated in polypectomy guidelines. And to be more specific, in the guidelines issued by the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy in 2017, Cold snaring is indicated for sessile or flat lesions of size up to nine millimeters in order to achieve unblock resection. More recently in 2020, the US Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer extended the indications for cold snaring to include not only diminutive and small polyps, but also lesions of size up to 19 millimeters with or without submucosal injection. And let's discuss the technique itself. So to begin with instruments, nowadays there are quite a few commercially available dedicated snares for cold snaring that are uh, thinner than traditional snares, are also smaller and have a stiffer sheath. And all these characteristics make basically the cutting process easier. And the basic technique consists of uh, three steps. So the first one being placing the lesion at our six o'clock position opening the snare, making sure that we include not only the polyp, but also a rim of normal mucosa, and closing the snare by applying downward pressure towards the colonic wall and firmly closing it to transect the polyp. So let's see, let's see how this works in real life. So this is a sessile serrated adenoma. We have placed the lesion at our six o'clock position, directly in front of the accessory channel of the endoscope. And we try to maintain this optimal position throughout the uh, resection. Uh, of course, we have meticulously inspected the surface of the lesion for signs of dysplasia, both with near focus and NBI. And we have now opened the snare to crown the polyp, as well as a rim of normal mucosa around it. And now we will be applying downward pressure towards the colonic wall, and we will close the snare by also applying suction which allows for uh, the tissue to bunch up into the snare. And this is what the resection site looks like. So we can observe the minimal oozing, as well as this whitish cord that is protruding from the site that we will be discussing later. This is another case of a small adenoma. And again, we have placed it at our six o'clock. And we have in detail inspected the surface for any signs of dysplasia. And we open the snare, making sure that we ensnare not only the polyp, but also a rim of normal mucosa. And again, by downward pressure towards the, the colonic wall, we close the uh, snare firmly and we transect the tissue. And now we can observe the minimal oozing upon resection. So the technique is pretty much uh, straightforward. Occasionally, some questions might arise as to whether or not, for example, we should use submucosal injection. So submucosal injection is not necessary for the resection itself or for the safety of the procedure. And whether or not it improves complete resection rates, um, basically the available evidence is controversial up till now. Uh, on the other hand, it can also be quite time consuming, especially if we're dealing with numerous uh, diminutive and small polyps. So adding an extra step might uh, actually prolong the uh, procedure considerably. Having said that, um, in cases where the borders of the lesion are uh, difficult to distinguish, uh, submucosal injection with the addition of some blue dye like indigo carmine, for example, uh, might actually be very helpful for delineation of the lesion. 
another challenge that might arise uh, during cold snaring is when the, uh, the snare is not cutting. Basically, this means that while we firmly close the snare to transect the tissue, this does, this does not occur. In this case, what we can do to mitigate it is to apply some extra mechanical force by gently pulling back the snare into the endoscope. This usually works. If it doesn't, we can change the orientation of the snare by slightly opening it, moving it a bit, and then closing it back again. Uh, we try to avoid opening the snare completely because occasionally it might interfere with the resection margins and ultimately with the completeness of the resection. So what is this? This is something that we very commonly observe uh, upon resection at the uh, resection site after cold snaring. So now we know that this is bunched up some mucosa. So it does not correspond to residual neoplastic tissue and therefore does not warranty any further treatment or endoscopic resection for that matter. And the cold revolution seems to continue since nowadays there are quite a few emerging evidence about uh, the application of cold, of cold snaring for a piecemeal resection of larger lesions as well as for pedunculated polyps. So in a retrospective um, study that was uh, recently published comparing piecemeal cold snare with uh, endoscopic uh, mucosal resection uh, for large sessile serrated lesions, both techniques exhibited high technical success with no adverse events in the cold snare group. Whereas in the EMR group, there was a 5.1% of uh, clinically significant post polypectomy bleeding, a 2.8% of deep neural injury, and two cases of uh, delayed perforation, whereas the recurrence rates were comparable for both techniques. Uh, in another uh, retrospective study comparing cold and hot snare for pedunculated polyps of size up to nine millimeters, um, delayed bleeding was also more commonly observed in the hot snare group, although most of the lesions in this group had prophylactic clipping after the resection. What was more commonly observed in the cold snare group was immediate bleeding, which is to be expected, although the difference between the two groups was significant. And we should also mention that in this case, 20% of the lesions in the hot snare group had also prophylactic clipping prior to the resection. So this might have been a factor contributing to this uh, wide difference between uh, immediate bleeding in the two groups. So the favorable bleeding profile uh, of cold snaring uh, is represented, is reflected, if you want, in the recent guidelines by BSG and the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy that suggest that we could consider cold snare polypectomy for lesions less than 10 millimeters in size, even in patients on continued clopidogrel monotherapy. So to sum it up, uh, cold snaring is uh, a simple yet safe and efficacious resection technique and the commercially available dedicated snares uh, make the cutting process easier and are wide enough to ensure a resection not only of the polyp, but also the margin of normal mucosa around it. Uh, sudden postal injection is not usually necessary and the minimal oozing that is uh, observed upon resection is usually self-limited and clinically insignificant. Uh, so according to the current evidence, cold snare polypectomy uh, is an appropriate standard approach for diminutive and small polyps. Uh, having said that, we have to keep in mind that the shallow cutting plane, um, so, uh, nevertheless, given the shallow cutting plane, uh, it should not be considered for lesions with evidence of high-grade dysplasia. And in any case, meticulous inspection of the surface of the lesion is imperative prior to any resection technique. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, there is now emerging evidence uh, that even large sessile serrated lesions with no evidence of dysplasia could be considered candidates for piecemeal resection by cold snaring and even pedunculated polyps. So I think that in the future, there is a lot uh, to be seen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vlaho, for this really brilliant uh, overview of uh, cold snaring. Uh, you managed to cover everything in great detail, even though you were uh, uh, even more punctual. Uh, you, you not only stuck the time, but you did it in less than 12 minutes. So really, really 
thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. Um, uh, I wish now to uh, ask uh, Dr. Moreno Alberto um, uh, to step in uh, to give us his talk about um, uh, polypectomy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks Ed, for the introduction. And uh, it's a very, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And you know, it's outstanding faculty from all over the world. I can see there are around 400 people connected. So it's it's really, really a great honor. So um, I'm going to speak about um, pedunculated polyp treatment. So we'll start with definition, polypectomy principles, Haggit classification, complication, alternative techniques, and conclusions. So first of all, we need to characterize the lesion. So um, pedunculated polyp, also called 1P lesion, when they have a clear stoke and a long stoke, or subpedunculated uh, polyp when they have a small, so in short, and uh, a wide stoke. And um, I found this uh, little video from Professor Raju, uh, which I recommend to all the, par all the uh, attendees on uh, YouTube, and it's very didactical, and they cover the principle of uh, uh, resection. So the first thing you need to keep in mind is that the current density when you apply the cut. So it's important that um, you have uh, a very, you snare tightly the stock of the poly so that you can apply a, effective cut because the current density it's um, increased when you um, cut with a snare a small portion of the stoke. The larger is the portion of the stoke or, or the polyp that you resect, the uh, lower is the current density and therefore the longer it takes to uh, resect the um, polyp or the stoke with your snare. So always, always close uh, tightly uh, the snare. Um, usually you should at least place the snare in the middle of the stoke because during the resection, the stoke can shrink. And if you place it too close to the head, you might not have a full resection. A complete resection. Another thing, the current, it travels to a narrow or a small area of uh, contact. So if you have a small area of contact here, then the current tend to travel here. On the opposite, if you have a, a larger, a broad area of contact, like between the polyp and the head of the polyp and the mu Cosa and the uh, colonic wall, the current traveled through the snare because again, it traveled to the narrowest area uh, of contact. You also have to keep in mind that if you have some metallic lip close to you, then this can actually um, cause um, to the coagulate, to the uh, electricity to travel from the snare to the clip. So you need to avoid any contact. Usually what we do and what we recommend is to be careful that the polyp is not touching anywhere with the colonic wall. That's the simplest way to avoid any travel um, of the um, electricity. Now the ESG guidelines as mentioned before by ERC uh, also include the pedunculated poly because one of the major question and one of the difference in technique between endoscopies that you will see is do we inject the poly do, uh, do, or we don't. Um, so for poly with a head larger than 20 millimeter and a stoke um, thicker than 10 millimeter then ESG guidelines from 2017 recommend either adrenaline injection or mechanical hemostasis. And mechanical hemostasis is uh, done with uh, endoloop or clipping. 
and we'll see this. So that's extremely important to keep in mind and we'll come back to that. This is a polypectomy done in uh, at the Royal Free in our hospital. So you see you have a, a polyp with a large uh, head. So we inject the stoke, we snare it carefully, and then we go closer to the base of the polyp, we cut, we then have a small oozing, but nothing difficult to control with the tip of the snare, and then close with a clip. Now, why did we cut close to the base of the stalk? Because we have in mind the Huggett classification, which means that we have always in mind that the, there might be some cancerous cells that might invade the submucosa. So the Huggett classification is very easy. So you have a level one, uh, which is where some cells, carcinomatous cells, may be limited to the polyped and to the um, muscularis mucosa. Um, then you have level two, when the cells can be limited to the neck. Level three can be limited to the stoke. Level four, infiltrating the submucosal. So we usually snare around this area so that we achieve uh, a complete resection, at least of the head, the neck, and the stoke. What are the risks of polypectomy in this kind of poly? Of course, perforation, although it's very small and it tends to happen when you cut too close to the base of the poly. And uh, when, um, or as we saw, when the current um, travel to towards the head of the polyp in a small, uh, narrow area uh, in contact with a uh, colonic wall. And then you might have bleeding, which might be up to 24%, although it usually is around three to 4%. It can be peri procedure, so it might occur during the procedure, or it might be post polypectomy, usually up to 48 hours after the procedure, although and that's, that's the, the peak, although you can have a post polypectomy bleeding even after a uh, longer time. Uh, how do you treat it? How do you prevent it? With injection, clip, and endoloop. So here, another video done performed in our unit. We have inject, injected the stock of the poly, but we are not, uh, we want to be extra safe. So we place an endoloop. Um, it's, it's quite sometimes difficult to place the endoloop, but once it's done, you place the, the snare above uh, the end loop and you resect and you can see that there is no a single um, drop of blood. Another uh, method is the clipping method. This is uh, from uh, Gigi Medical uh, University um, from uh, uh, Professor Yamamoto's group. And it's a PJS poly in the small bowel, but it's, it's okay. It uh, also work and you can do this in every poly. Um, and then the important thing, you put two clips and the two clips need to be intersect each other. So this uh, stop the blood supply uh, of the stoke. And uh, there've been a lot of uh, um, publication over the years and even recently about the usefulness of the clipping method. And this Korean study um, confirmed also the result of a previous Korea study when you have that overall uh, bleeding and immediate, immediate bleeding is reduced by the clipping method significantly um, when compared to uh, no clipping method. Another prospective study for pedoncolated poly larger than 20 millimeters showed that adrenaline injection or endoloops or prophylactic hemoclips, they have the same um, prophylactic benefit in terms of post polypectomy bleeding, which is in contradiction with the previous two study, just Korean study. But even more, to make everything a little bit more confused, a very recent uh, publication by a multi centered publication from Japan, led by Professor Saito show that for polyps larger than 50 millimeter, endoloop is a significant inhibit factor for delayed bleeding. But when delayed bleeding was uh, uh, compared with not bleeding, um, prophylactic clipping 
an injection were significant risk factor for delay bleeding. So it, there is everything is uh, quite contradicting at the moment. And it's still, I think, um, under investigation. A meta-analysis uh, performed from six randomized controlled styles show that a prenephrine injection reduced the overall and early bleeding. But for uh, post-polypectomy bleeding, a prenephrine injection alone is not um, enough. In fact, it's the same result of a selling injection. And for polyp over 20 millimeter prophylactic mechanical hemostasis, so with end loop or clipping, clipping is more effective. Well, I think we can discuss this uh, during the discussion, but there is a lot of contradiction again. But why there are so many differences? Because polypectomy, post-polypectomy bleeding and bleeding during the polypectomy can be caused by several factors. 65 years old of age, cardiovascular, chronic renal disease, anticoagulation, polyp size bigger than 10 millimeter, stock size uh, larger than five millimeter, polyp in the right column, malignant polyp, which sometimes are uh, rejected by mistake because the um, maybe the characterization uh, of the polyp was not really accurate. And maybe sometimes it's difficult to find out the invasion uh, through the stoke. Um, the cutting mode is also uh, very important when you don't have coagulation and, and cutting, but you only use a pure cutting, you might have an increased risk of bleeding. And uh, endoscopist with uh, not much experience, a low volume procedure might have also increased risk of, is a, is a factor for increased risk of bleeding. Alternative techniques, when we have very large polyp, what you can do is instead of snare, when it's difficult to um, snare them, uh, we can uh, perform ESD of the stoke of the polyp. Uh, you can use different knife, flash knife or SB knife. The, um, any knife has been proven quite uh, useful. Uh, another little uh, uh, difference. So we uh, used, this is a PJS. This is a polypectomy done in our unit in 2019. We used to inject and uh, um, resect the polyp. So you can see here, we have a little bit of bleeding and then nothing that cannot be treated with a, a clip. But uh, we recently have changed our practice following, of course, uh, the Gichi um, example. So we're now um, placing an Elno loop. You can see here, there is a very large uh, PJS here with a very large stoke. We place the endo loop. We wait for this chemic change. You can see the difference in color from the head of the polyp and the rest of the mucosa. And we leave it this in place. And this is a video from uh, a Gigi Medical University. Uh, again, this is a PJS in the small bowel. We snare it. Uh, they they have placed the handle loop and they uh, you can see the different in color of the head of the PJS. And we leave it because the ischemia that caused the different, uh, of the, 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 the color difference in the head of the polyp, then will cause necrosis and the polyp will fall off spontaneously. This is very low risk compared to standard uh, polypectomy. And if you have a, you know, post polypectomy bleeding in the small bowel, it's quite difficult then to, to treat it endoscopically in a, in a rapid um, amount of time. So in conclusion, um, polypectomy for this kind of polyp is safe and effective. We also need to keep in mind the Paris classification and always assess the polyp before resection. Um, cut as near uh, as usual. Um, we have the classic polypectomy technique is still the standard of practice. As Ersi said, calls near for small polyp as now is on niche. And, uh, but we should use alternative technique for some uh, particular cases as ESD or PJS the endo loop. 
and uh, of course apply pre-polypectomy hemostasis. This is my point of view as recommended for the ESG guidelines, um, injection, endo loop or clipping, better than nothing. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto, for a lovely presentation on uh, polypectomy techniques. Um, uh, we will discuss uh, this, I'm sure, uh, later. Uh, and in the interest of time, um, I shall move uh, to the next uh, speaker, um, uh, Professor Burgess, Nick Burgess, from uh, uh, Australia, who's going to really talk to us about uh, EMR in the topic and code section. Thank you, Nick. Yes, thank, thanks very much, and uh, thanks to the organisers for inviting me to talk. Um, I'm going to talk about colorectal EMR, and I'm going to focus on making the right resection decisions and improving outcomes. So these are the things I'm going to go over, and I'm very grateful to the speakers before me who um, have covered many of the um, aspects in terms of looking at lesions and deciding on the um, uh, whether or not there's underlying malignancy, uh, and uh, cold sneering as well. So it's very, very helpful preceding this talk. I'm going to focus on um, colon lesions over 20 millimeters in size. And because it's a limited talk, I'm not going to cover lots of the tricky things, ileocecal valve lesions, anorectal junction lesions, fibrotic lesions, appendiceal lesions. I'm just going to go for the things that I think are fundamental to performing good EMR and having good outcomes for your patient. One of the key things is appraising the lesion. Optical evaluation, evaluating whether or not there's cancer or submucosal invasion, and then deciding on which technique you're going to use. Um, and many of us will have seen overt cancers before. There's obvious features to them. They're, they're ulcerated, distorted. Um, they'll often be fixed. And uh, it's very easy to see. The surface pattern is disrupted and altered. Um, and this is obviously a deep submucosal invasive cancer. Um, lesions such as this one also have evidence of deep submucosal invasion. It's important to be able to recognize this. Even if you don't have um, op optical um, chromoendoscopy or uh, magnification, you should be able to see a demarcated area, see an area of changed pit pattern. And if you can see that, and it's consistent with deep invasion, then they need a surgical referral. If you're unsure, you can refer for expert appraisal at a tertiary center um, to make a decision. The other key things, if you can't see an area, a focal area of demarcation or obvious submucosal invasion, then the next thing to look at is um, the risk of cancer within the lesion. So hidden cancer and the risk of that. And the key things to look at are location in the colon, the morphology and surface features, and the size of the lesion. Location is important because we know that left-sided lesions have a higher risk of cancer overall. So this is data from the ACE study. Lesions that are proximal to the sigmoid colon have a risk of cancer of around 5% overall. And in the sigmoid colon or rectum, uh, that goes up to around 13%. So location, very important in assessing the risk of submucosal invasion. Um, the next thing is surface features and morphology. And we know that these things, along with location, give us a really good way of, of deciding how risky or how, how much risk of submucosal invasion there is in each lesion. So a lot of um, proximal colon lesions that are, that are flat, granular, um, and uh, 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 so 0, 2A, para 0, 2A, they will have a very low risk of, of hidden submucosal invasion. So if you've assessed it, you can't see a demarcated area of cancer, they've got a very low risk of an underlying um, submucosal invasion, ideal targets for endoscopic mucosal resection. Whereas if you're looking at a 1S non-granular lesion that's in the distal colon, particularly in the rectum, um, then these lesions have a very high risk of hidden submucosal invasive cancer. These ones are the ones that you should probably target for on-block resection or potentially ESD. We know that if you appraise a flat lesion and you can't see any obvious signs of cancer within that, um, then, then it's uh, a very, very low risk of having a hidden, hidden sub focus of submucosal invasive cancer. Um, whereas if you have a nodular lesion, then the risk of missing a cancer is much higher. 
So once again, if you've got a flat granular 2A lesion and you can't see any focus of cancer, it's a, it's a great target for EMR because you're unlikely to miss anything. So for these examples, proximal right colon granular 2A lesion will have a, a low risk of cancer and is a good target for EMR. If it's got a nodule and it's in the left colon, it may have a higher risk. And lesions that are 1S um, in the rectum um, may have a considerable risk of submucosal invasive cancer. So these are, these are lesions that should be targeted for OMBOC or endoscopic resection or ESD. Um, we know that in the rectum, rectal surgery is, is high risk, and uh, we want to make sure that we can resect and cure polyps in this area with a high risk of submucosal and can invasive cancer or evidence of sub superficial submucosal cancer. So it's important that we, that we um, use an appropriate technique for a complete resection of these, and, and ESD is something we should consider. Um, this is a study from Westmead where we looked at um, uh, resecting all uh, rectal lesions by EMR, and that was in the period prior to about two, 2016 or so. After 2016, we looked at using a selective technique where we selected lesions that had a large nodule or larger in size um, or had over, uh, surface features which were um, consistent with superficial cancer. You can see that in the universal group where we did EMR for all rectal lesions, the cancer risk was 12%, and only two of them were absolutely cured by that EMR procedure. In, the, in this new cohort, when we're looking at lesions that we've done selectively, the ones where we can't see any high-risk features, we only found one cancer, so we only missed one cancer, and all of them were in the ESD group. So the curative resection rate was much, much higher and so it's important to choose it, an appropriate technique for this. It's not a battle between ESD and EMR. They can work together in harmony. Um, and this is the most appropriate approach for lesions in the colon. Choose the appropriate technique. And speaking of technique, simple things make um, EMR much easier. So this is a, uh, is a 2A plus 1, 1S um, lesion in the, in the rectum. It's uh, got surface features which have been examined as no obvious overt cancer, but there is a dominant nodule in it. Um, so we've resected that first. And the thing that we do here when we're performing EMR is make sure first that your, um, that your scope position is good, that you've rolled the patient to keep fluid away from the lesion. You use dynamic injection to lift the lesion up and put it in the appropriate spot. And then make sure you take care with snare positioning, position outside the lesion, resect um, within the defect and try not to leave little areas like this um, where you may leave a small area of um, focal um, non-resected uh, tissue. You want to really make sure that you resect all of these completely. Uh, make sure you perform the resection with wide margins. Make sure you use downward pressure, aspirate gas with each of your resections and check mobility as well to make sure muscularis propria is not ens ensnared. Sequentially move across the, across the defect um, and use water jet to try and make sure that you've um, adequately expanded the submucosa. Uh, and then at, at the completion, sorry, I skipped ahead, but make sure you use an appropriate margin ablation technique to reduce recurrence. So this is snare tip soft coagulation to complete the, the entire margin of the lesion. In terms of preventing adverse events, I'll cover these quickly, but I think they're very important. Deep mural injury is, is extremely important. Tar the target sign many of you will be familiar with, this was um, first described in 2011. That's a disc of muscularis propria that you can see both on the resection defect and often within the specimen itself. That's evidence that the muscularis propria has been injured or resected. We've developed a score to look at this. Type zero is no injury. Type one is where the muscularis propria is uh, exposed. Type two is where you're not quite sure what's going on. Type three is a resection where, which has removed part of the um, uh, muscularis. And type four is a complete hole with type five with, uh, with uh, prep or bowel contents going through that. These are them um, depicted endoscopically. And you can see that the type two lesion here is one where you can't be clear whether or not there's fibrotic change or injury to that, um, to that layer. 
Type one is like the underlying uh, undersurface of a um, uh, of a whale. And this is a type four. It's clear that that's a hole. So when we've looked at this in a study, we've shown that basically one of the perforations, we saw very few perforations when these were de detected, but the one perforation that we did see was in the, a person with a type two injury. So we recommend clipping all type two, three, four, and five lesions completely. Think about the risk factors for a hole or a perforation. Tr the transverse colon or the, uh, is very high risk. Any lesion that has high grade dysplasia or submucosal invasive cancer, and any lesion that you're attempting to resect on block above 20 or 22 millimeters in size, you may have a higher risk, particularly in the proximal colon. These lesions can be, uh, you know, um, type three lesions can be completely clip closed. And so um, it's important to, um, to close them completely. We've seen in a large cohort, uh, international cohort, that these injuries are uncommon. Uh, but if we deal with them appropriately, the chance of requiring urgent surgery is very, very low. Only three in 3,700 resections in this study. When you close the lesions, make sure you move sequentially across, starting from one side and moving across to zipper it closed. Um, it's a difficult technique, uh, but you, you must practice it and, and, um, and you'll, you'll master it. Um, in terms of Preventing post-EMR bleeding, do we clip or not clip? The answer is from recent studies uh, in the proximal colon, yes, we clip these lesions cl closed post-EMR. Um, delayed bleeding is considerably higher in proximal colon lesions. It's not changed in distal lesions. So no point closing the distal lesions, but make sure you close the proximal lesions. This was very clearly shown in this, um, uh, this study in gastroenterology. Um, where the proximal colon bleeding was much higher. We've also performed this at Westmead Hospital and shown very similar results. Complete closure um, definitely in the proximal colon reduces bleeding. It's most effective for lesions 20 to 39 millimeters in size. Above 50 millimeters in size, even in our expert center, only two out of 18 lesions were completely closed. Um, so it is a tricky, tricky thing when you've got large lesions, um, but, uh, but you must attempt to close these um, overall. And again, even large lesions can be potentially closed. Ablation to reduce recurrence is now something that should be a standard. Um, snare tip soft coagulation using um, uh, Irby um, effect for an 80 watts um, soft coagulation. You can basically coagulate the um, margins very easily. Um, with very few um, adverse events. And then we've done a randomized start trial that shows that this really does significantly reduce recurrence rates, particularly in larger lesions. So this is over 40 millimeters in size. Recurrence rates are significantly reduced. When we've looked at it across uh, an international um, five tertiary center study, we've shown that if you can completely ablate the margins of these lesions, recurrence rates are uh, exceedingly low, down at 1.4% for everyone that's had a complete margin ablation. If you've incompletely ablated the margins, the recurrence rates are much higher. So the few that had an incomplete recurrence had a much higher rate of around 27%. Um, so it's important to ablate carefully. Uh, you can see in this example, around the top, it's probably incompletely ablated. It's not wide enough. So just watch for that. And uh, I, th I think that the, um, the prior talks on cold resection are in incredibly important because I think this is part of the future of colon resection. Um, piecemeal cold snares, um, uh, polypectomy is exceedingly good for cis ulcerated lesions. Um, bleeding rates are low, um, perforation is, is infrequent. Technique is important, but it's a very effective uh, method for review, re uh, removing cess ulcerated polyps. This is our recent study from Westmead that was um, displayed before. Um, essentially recurrence rates, very similar, adverse events rates, much higher in EMR. So I think we'll be seeing this on the rise in the future. And in summary, um, I just wanted to say that pathology and the patient should guide the resection approach. Make sure you appraise each lesion. And as has been shown in the talks previously, choose the appropriate technique for the appropriate polyp that's in front of you. Bulky rectal lesions, really, um, they should be done by ESD, I think now. Proximal colon cessorosorated lesions should be done by piecemeal cold snare polypectomy. 
Um, good resection decisions are as important as technique for good outcomes. So it's important to um, un understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. But also focusing on technique is important. Getting the simple things right will make complex resections much easier. And think about how you can improve outcomes for your patients. Um, for DMI, identify that and clip it. For, a bleed for bleeding risk, proximal colon clips are very important. And to prevent recurrence, use margin ablation or some form of snare tip soft coagulation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, uh, that was a brilliant talk um, uh, covering practically everything from the uh, authoritative center of EMR um, uh, in Westmeath, Australia. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so now I'm going to uh, ask the uh, final speaker, um, uh, Professor Hayashi from uh, Jichi Medical University in Japan um, uh, to give us his talk on uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection. Thank you, Yoshi. Thank you for a uh, kind introduction. I'd like to express my gratitude to our uh, chairman, Professor Tibor Jukeles and Professor Edward J. Despot. Uh, so I'm very happy to uh, attend this uh, fantastic uh, meeting. So. Uh, by the way, uh, I'd like to talk about techniques in toric syringe causal dissection today. So just a moment. So we have performed uh, ESD since 1998. These pictures were uh, the first colorectal ESD performed by Professor Yamamoto. Then uh, we can say that our facility is the best place of colorectal ESD. Then we have had a lot of experience of ESDs so far. Then I would like to present seven our techniques and tricks today. The first is suck the gas to make ESD easier. Sucking gas makes the world tangential. Even if the region located behind the crescent floor it can be changed to horizontal one after setting gas. Even the vertical orientation can be changed. So uh, look at this right left picture. Even if the region rotated vertical world after setting gas, it can it, uh, be changed to uh, horizontal, horizontal rotation after setting gas. Setting gas keeps the submucosa thicker. To much air stretches the colon wall. So uh, to is too much insufflation, uh, uh, insufflation uh, extends not only muscularis but also injected submucosa. Though after setting just yes, the uh, intestinal lumen of a shrinking and injected submucosa become thicker like this. And setting gas keeps the end stop stable. So after setting gas, the intestinal lumen will be smaller, which uh, contribute to uh, make table of end scope stable because the lumen becomes smaller. The second is submucosal injection. Should we perform right in storing roof tiles? We shouldn't inject solution into the mass layer. After sticking the mucosa, inject the solution only into the submucosa while at the same time withdrawing the needle carefully. You should not inject it into the muscle layer because intramuscular injection makes rate, uh, rata recognition of submucosa more difficult. Next, the injection should be performed at the edge of the previous elevation in an overlapping fashion. It guarantees extension of the submucosa. Inject gently and at each edge repeatedly. Successive submucosal injections elevate the entire tumor. If you perform separated mucosal injections, the risk of intramuscular injection will be greater. Intramuscular injections make ESD difficult. The third is for easier access to the submucosa. We shouldn't dissect just below, uh, we should dissect just below the tumor side mucosa. Even the ST hood cannot enter the submucosa just after the initial mucosa incision. Uh, even if we do so, if we, do so uh, we just pushing mucosa, mucosa. 
when she dissects just below the tumor side of the mucosa to make the entrance large. So please the fine free part, the edge of the tumor side of the mucosa using a knife face. After the dissection, the ST hook can enter the mucosa. Fourth is the entrance should be far away from the tumor edge to achieve great attraction and prevent mucosal edge rolling. The specimen edge receives strong upward traction. If the entrance is too close, this causes the tumor side edge to roll under the tumor. Along the tumor side edge allows the end stop to provide greater traction. This allows you to gradually dissect downwards to reach the mass layer. Uh, in addition, distant entrance conquers downhill tumor and stop in the sub because the space with distant entrance can lift the entire downhill tumor, which keeps tangential approach to the mass layer. Moreover, distant entrance conquers tumor over fold. Even though, uh, even though the tumor is over four, it can be managed by enscoping in the submucosal space with distant entrance. In a tumor with submucosal five, severe submucosal fibrosis, a uh, distant entrance is better. <clears throat> uh, just a moment, I skip it. So when the tip of the enscope reaches a fibrosis, the tip provides a reliable traction. The fifth is Keep the mass layer inside. We shouldn't damage mass layer. We should dissect just above the mass layer. So you can see the surface of the mass layer through a foot hood in the submucosal space like this. As this yellow dotted line shows, it's possible to dissect submucosa just above the mass layer like it. So please end. Uh, please remember, note, notice uh, the mass layer is not always flat. Even if the mass layer is uneven, you can safely dissect just the mass layer by holding it with edge of SD head. The six uh, successive shoot dissections make a safe and precise dissection line. When you start to cut some mucosa, you should Hug the submucosal tissue in the direction you want to cut. Then press pedal for a short time. Perf then perform, please perform successive short dissections. Eventually, they result in a safe and precise dissection line. The last is traction techniques facilitates ESD for fast, easy, and reliable procedures. So a lot kind of de dedicated traction devices are commercially available now. Uh, they surely facilitate ESD, though uh, one of them costs over 200 US dollars. As you know, traction can stretch a submucosa between the mucosa and the masteroris. However, it requires counter-traction as well. So unless counter-traction, the muscularis is also pulled up. In that situation, we should be careful not to damage uh, pulled muscularis, pulled upward. <clears throat> then uh, we, have, we must uh, produce counter-traction uh, against it. Mm. So for instance, in suffration to make the muscularis flatten or uh, holding uh, elevation of the uh, lip pulled muscularis using end scope tip. So uh, I would like to present uh, an example of ESD using traction as the nongrania in the ascending column. So first I injected 0.4% sodium hyaluronate, then uh, and tip of the end scope enter into submucosal space. This region unfortunately has a focal submucosal fibrosis because of previous biopsy done in other hospital. Though uh, in this procedure, uh, we use pocket collision method uh, as the further can stretch uh, even submucosal fibrosis, then we can uh, dissect it safely 
uh, without damaging mass price. After making the project, we put circumferential incision. Then we graph the distal edge of the partially resected specimen and pull back a few centimeters and connect it to the opposite wall mucosa. So after uh, providing traction using a single clip, uh, we can have good uh, aspect view and provide traction to stretch the remaining submucosa like this. Finally, we remove the clip using forceps. The region, this region was uh, submucosal invasive cancer, although we achieved axial resections. So I skip this one. So uh, there are about com uh, covers it. Let's review today's items. Uh, Suck the gas to make ESD easier. Submucosal injections should be done like arranging roof tiles. Don't inject it into the mass layer. Making, making the, the entrance easier, please dissect just below the tumor side mucosa. The entrance should be far away from the tumor. Keep the mass layer in sight. Don't damage mass layer. Succession of short dissections makes safe and precise dissection line. And finally, traction techniques facilitate ESD. Uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yoshi, very much for your very didactic, useful uh, lecture, uh, which was, uh, I think, useful not only for beginners, but even for, for experts. So we are, at the, uh, we are at the end of the lectures and we made a little time uh, and have a lot of questions. So uh, I will start with questions and then ask first uh, Professor Sano to uh, answer them, okay? I will not mention the uh, person who asked because we have no uh, enough time, okay? What, first question, uh, may I use methylene blue instead of indigo carmine? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, uh, angiocarmine dye is a contrast method, but the methylene blue is a staining method. A little bit, uh, so meaning is uh, different, but uh, yes, any, anyway, you can use uh, both uh, methylene blue and angiocarmine. Okay. Uh, another question is about conic calcification. Okay, just for attendees, conic calcification of polyp is a combination of Paris, NBI, Kudo, Sano, LST, and VASP. French are always special, okay? What's your, what, what's your comment? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, it's a bit difficult to answer the, uh, so uh, uh, we finally uh, so established a genetic classification uh, last uh, 20 years. Uh, I proposed a sun classification at first uh, 2006. So, uh, I think uh, latest classification is very useful. I think I believe <laughs> it's a very difficult to answer. Okay, let's move. Yeah. On. Um, what is the sensitivity and specificity of gene at the one in differentiating hyperplastic polyps to SSL, especially mm. the right polyps? Yes, that's a very important question. Uh, uh, we already uh, investigated such a uh, issue. But unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult to uh, distinction between uh, SSL or hyperplastic body using uh, so uh, genetic classification or uh, anyway, uh, BLY and by observation. So uh, I think uh, it's very important to size, uh, precise size. Uh, I think more than five or six uh, is uh, prevalence of the SSL or this plastic region is uh, increasing. So. I believe the uh, so uh, more than six or five million size SSI cell region or genetic type one or nice one region should be removed. Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, uh, could you please re-explain, please briefly, how to assess depths of invasion? Depths. Uh, I mentioned already. Uh, so the uh, diameter uh, of the uh, irregular pits or irregular uh, area uh, more than three million size flat region, more than six million size flat region, uh, very created with uh, SM 
deep invasion. It's very key to diagnose. Three six rule, okay? Just yeah, sorry. Three six rule, okay? Three. Yeah, three six rule. Yes, you're right. <laughs> uh, now we move to Erasmia. Thank you, Sano. Uh, Thank you. Erasmia, uh, when uh, do you apply suction exactly during polypectomy? Um, we do it while closing the snare, so as to make sure that uh, we gather the, the tissue that we have managed to ensnare, uh, so that it's, it is bunched up in the closing snare. So basically, as we close the snare, we apply suction. Okay, uh, the next question is to you and also for Nick, I think. Uh, uh, what is, how is the safety core snaring for polyps? between uh, 10 to 15 millimeters and scar sessile lesion in soku large lesion core snaring safety okay uh shall i go for it uh, I guess, okay. uh so yes it's a safe procedure um i have presented and uh, dr burgess has presented the evidence um for even piecemeal resection for large lesions um, there is no difference in the technique itself as to um, where we uh, perform the, the, the cold snaring. So basically the same way we do it in the rectum, we will be doing it in the cecum as well. And uh, we know that it is very safe regarding bleeding. And we also know that it is safe regarding perforation. It is only some few case reports. What we should take in mind is the inspection of the lesion and making sure that it is not a high grade dysplasia related lesion. Uh, so as far as safety is concerned and efficacy, it can be applied. Okay, Nid, would you like to add something? Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's very safe. I think one thing to do, um, one thing to watch out for is potential recurrence. If you're performing piecemeal cold snare polypectomy, it's important to water jet the defect and make sure that you're performing sequential resections. Don't be too greedy with each bite. Move sequentially and try and get the whole lesion. Also leave a wide margin. So I prefer to use um, submucosal injection because it allows you to see the margin a lot more easily. If you don't use it and you're performing resection of a cis ulcerated lesion, then sometimes there's, there's bleeding and you get sort of a bit lost. Um, and you may leave a small area of potential that, that could become recurrent. So I think it's really important to um, just be very meticulous about your technique uh, for that piecemeal resection. Um, may I also say something about piecemeal uh, resection? Uh, I think that in this case, while we use some mucosal injection, it is useful to also add some adrenaline that might... Um, make the oozing um, a lot less so we have a clear site and then we can place the lesion more the the snare more accurately so as to overlap with the previous resection and making sure that there are no aisles of residual tissue uh, in the successive resections okay thank you uh, next question is about uh, uh, polyp polyps polyps resection i think it's go to alberto yes so for Potsieger polyp resection, um, historically, we used to inject and resect with a snare. But uh, as uh, you know, Professor Yamamoto, Professor Yano, and the Gichi Medical University team showed, it's uh, uh, more not only more effective, is is effective and and uh, has less complication to place a snare around large face jagged polyp in a small bowel, and then. You need to check though that there is an ischemic event happening so that the polyp change co in color compared to the normal mucosa and then uh, you leave the end loop. This will cause necrosis of the head of the polyp and the polyp will come off at some point. It's also important to, the, uh, to clear you know, the rectal root first, so the distal part of the small bowel. So make sure that there are no polyps there uh, if you want to resect the proximal part of the small bowel, because if there is any large polyp left in the distal part of the small bowel, then once the polyp from the proximal part would fell off, they might get stuck with the polyp still in place in the distal part of the small bowel it cause obstruction. So clear the distal part first, and then you clear the proximal part. And I mean, 
if you want to add anything. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Uh, thank you, Alberto. Um, uh, we've got a few questions here about uh, uh, the setting. Okay, so uh, it's a general question to the whole panel, actually. Um, uh, should we be very didactic about the uh, settings for uh, polypectomy or endoscopic mucosal resection when we are using snares? Um, uh, what is the typical? I mean, you, it's all dependent on what electrosurgical generator you use, of course, but uh, what, uh, what are your favorite uh, settings when you are doing, for example, a, a polypectomy uh, with a stalk uh, and also with EMR? And I'll, I'll ask the whole group to uh, give, give their uh, options, their opinion, even you, Tibor, please. Uh, if, if you could start, um, uh, maybe <laughs> Professor Thano. <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm uh, sorry. I, configuration of the settings um, for resection. When you're doing a, a snare polypectomy and when you're doing an EMR in, in your hospital, um, uh, do you have any, any preferred um, uh, types of uh, settings or uh, uh, just a general guidance? Because we've had several questions about this. Okay, so cutting current, uh, 120 uh, watts uh, usually. Uh, who are cutting, yes, who are EMR. So you tend to use endocut, which is a blended current of uh, a bit of coagulation with cut, correct? Uh, yes, uh, yes, with uh, endocut, yes. Actually, yes, yeah. uh, thank you. Another uh, member from Japan, Yoshi, would you agree with that? Would you tend to use endocut Q? Thank you for asking me. So I put, um, so uh, when when I resecting our uh, flat regions, uh, I prefer using a pure cut board because uh, we have no we have no flat regions. Don't have regions don't have uh, thick uh, big blood vessels. Then even if we encountered immediate bleeding, uh, it will not be a uh, uh, serious burn. We can control that. Though, uh, meanwhile, when dissecting penetrated polyp, uh, it depends on the size of the head, though we prefer to place uh, end rope with, uh, just in case. If we place, uh, placed, uh, strangulated the stock of the polyps, surely uh, I usually cut the polyp using also pure cut because pure cut mode will prevent directed bleeding and damaging uh, this and damage uh, prevent damaging this uh, deep portion of the intestinal wall so uh, and uh, when i performing underwater emr uh, our indicate our indication for underwater emr is are limited in uh, relatively flat regions. Then I usually uh, resect them using also pure cut mode. Even if we encounter the immediate massive bleeding, we can control the bleeding because we have to use, used to control our uh, massive bleeding during performing ASD. And uh, so in my opinion, delayed bleeding is really bothersome. Uh, because uh, if the patient uh, after going home, uh, the patient have to come back to our hospital, sometimes using ambulances. Though so immediate bleeding can make us known point of bleeding uh, with active bleeding. Then, uh, so there are reason why I prefer to prefer using uh, pure cut, sorry. For, uh, using much very, very useful strategy. Thank you. Uh, it just goes to show that there's different ways to do it. Um, uh, Nick, what's your strategy? Uh, settings for polypectomy, settings for EMR. So, well, so typically for uh, stalk polypectomy, I'd use a force coagulation current. And then if it stalls or if it's difficult to cut through, I'd switch to endo cut uh, Q effect three. Um, to cut through the rest of the stalk, and I think that just coagulates. If there's a, if there's an uh, if there's a vessel in the middle of the stalk, it'll typically coagulate it, and you'll get less sort of immediate bleeding. Um, for for EMR, we use endocut Q effect three, 
Um, and uh, the the nice thing about that is it's a um, you know it's a microprocessor controlled current sensors resistance. Um, so those things uh, they, they they allow the the current to back off um, if if it's uh, if there's too much resistance there. Um, the I know that there's been a um, you know many people would say they they choose to use force coagulation to perform EMR. Um, and we initially thought that that might have been associated with more um, deep thermal injury. Um, we'd seen it in pig colons, and we'd also seen it in ob observational studies. Um, but there's been a nice RCT that's been performed recently, which is basically yellow versus blue pedal for EMR. And really, there's no significant difference in terms of delayed bleeding or perforation related to using either of those currents. I think the important thing is to make sure that you have a nice submucosal cushion because that protects your muscularis propria from any of these, um, uh, from, from your you know, thermal sink effect. And if you perform EMR well and have a nice lift, then regardless of the current you use, um, you're unlikely to get um, problems related to that. Um, a, a nice, sorry, last thing is a nice more pure cut current um, will give you a nicer tissue resection margin. So I know in that yellow versus blue study, they actually use endocut Q effect two, which is um, slightly more cutting, and that gives you a nice nice margin. Uh, Nick, um, thank you for that. Uh, I'm sticking to the subject because it's so important, um, the settings and, uh, and also how to do it, because it's not just a factor of the current you're using, and the coagulate, but it's also a factor about how fast you close the snare. Uh, so when you're doing an EMR, fast cut, do you close the snare yourself? Um, uh, when you're doing a polypectomy, um, slow cut, um, what, what's your style and uh, why is it important? Yeah, I think we always control, for EMR, we always control the snare. We always take the handle and control the, control the cutting. Um, you know that you do want to really, uh, um, as Alberto showed, you want to you want to really close the snare enough so that you're getting the maximum effect of the tissue cutting through through that area that you're cutting. But you can't cut. You don't want to cut. You don't want to close really, really fir firmly because that can sometimes impede cutting. So it's important to feel that and close as well. Um, and I think it's I think it's a fundamental thing to to hold that with with um, with stalk polypectomy. I'm not so no so fussy about that. Um, I, I, I allow the you know your assistant to close it as long as it's um, reasonably tight. It's okay. Um, most of the time, I do I do take it, and, and um, I think with that, once again, you you slowly close through um, to allow the coagulation current to to um, slowly move through the stalk. Um, yeah, but I think it's important to hold to hold it yourself. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, Ersi, Alberto, and Tibor, um, we've only got one minute left. There's lots of different questions coming from all over the world. We don't have time to answer them all. Um, uh, but uh, have you got anything to add to what has been said by, by the other experts about this important topic about how to cut and what, what things to do in terms of electrosurgery? Ersi. So it seems to me that we have funds for PewCut and funds for EndoCut-Q. Uh, maybe your experience will be the most important for yourself, I think. So your experience, uh, bad experience, maybe you change your practice. So uh, uh, myself is a fan of endocat Q. Me too. I'm a fan of endocat Q and not so brave as a Yoshi with a pure endocat. Pure, pure cat, sorry. But, but you know, <clears throat> you, you, the, there is a rationale behind that. So it can be adopted in some occasion. Why not? So I agree. Uh, I think that is completely covered. I use undercut key as well. Okay. So, but, but the bottom line is beware delayed bleeding. The more coagulation you use, the greater the chance of delayed bleeding. Uh, better immediate bleeding than delayed bleeding. And nowadays we've got prophylactic measures that are coming out, such as um, uh, protein matrix. We need to understand it a bit more. Uh, there was a question on hemo spray. Um, I'm not sure about its role here. Uh, and there were also um, controversial topics about clipping. Um, I think from that controversial subject of clipping, if you are going to clip, 
uh, the lesion you recognize is probably more high risk of delayed bleeding, and that's the uh, confounding factor there, I think. So anyway, I think we're we're at the top of the hour and uh, well, end of the webinar. Tibor, would you like to would you like to close? Yes, thank you. I think it was very useful, and uh, everybody can learn everything, even in uh, rich countries and maybe more in poorer countries. Uh, and th this is the uh, task of the standard of practice and uh, publications committee of WEO. Uh, I think we have a lot of questions more. Uh, I ask our panelists, please answer them after the webinar. And I hope that uh, uh, somehow uh, the attendees can uh, see the, uh, these answers at the end. Thank you for all of you for your great lectures and thank you, Ed, for the great co-moderation. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much and thanks all the panel. Uh, you were great. Thank you. Thank you.